Hey, this is Manly with VerticalLessons.com, helping you stretch your comfort zone, impact more people with your leadership, and helping you reach your next summit. I love having people uh, on the show to talk to you and for you to get to know that have impacted my life or influenced me in some way. And occasionally, you meet someone who just blows your mind, uh, not necessarily with their accomplishments. In this case, it's both. But I met someone this past year. I was hanging out at a friend's house. And I met Mark Maloney, uh, who you're going to meet today and get to hear from. And the man has done so much in his life and, most importantly, an absolute inspiration in his actions and how he lives. Uh, I think you will be inspired. I think you'll find things that you can actually use in your life that will make a difference for you. Uh, Mark is known as, for a lot of different roles and accomplishments in his life. And the National Hockey League is a legend for developing players. He's worked with the Dallas Stars and a lot of other organizations. He's an author, speaker, a CEO, founder of an amazing organization that's going to truly revolutionize youth sports in multiple sports. And uh, if you haven't heard about it yet, you're going to hear about it today. But Mark is an amazing individual. And I was fortunate enough to meet him, and I'm happy to introduce you to him today. Mark, thank you for joining me and uh, sharing some of your journey and your story with us and uh, how you see life. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks for uh, for having me. I've been looking forward to talking to you. And the last time we spoke in Phoenix, uh, it was uh, it was such an amazing evening. It went way too fast. So I look forward to reconnecting with you. Thank you. So Mark, can you tell me a little bit about your journey and uh, what you're focused on today and how, how things have... Uh, been moving for you and my journey I guess um, uh, my journey's taken a few uh, drastic turns and um, I've had a lot of interesting experiences and um, a few years ago I got very very sick um, I was always the type of person that lived my life uh, for every moment every day and um, I've, got, I've got children and an amazing family and uh, uh, just out of the blue I was diagnosed with a, a very serious cancer and um, it didn't really change me, but it, it really uh, put front and center the importance of time and the value of time you have in your life. And um, uh, that journey has now spawned off new beginnings and new openings. And um, I guess I had a choice either to live or to die, and I made the choice to live. And so hence, um, sometimes when you face crisis, you really find out who you are, and uh, it can spawn opportunities that maybe never would have occurred had that adversity never never happened. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I guess, my journey is uh, I'm the type of person that um, uh, that can't wait to get up in the morning and tackle each day and uh, try to make a difference in the world and for myself and uh, and hopefully Im impact a few people along the way. Yeah, it seems like at the point that you had this major life event, to say the least, uh, yeah. most people would have just been content and uh, to really and supported you if you'd said, hey, I'm going to slow down and do things differently and kind of uh, focus on different areas of your life. It seems like to me that it actually uh, ignited you in a way, even though at, at your very lowest and some of your most, probably the most physically challenging thing you ever dealt with, you, I remember from your story that uh, it seemed like you just exploded with energy in a way, even though you were devastated physically, and uh, it, it ignited something in you that, uh, can you tell me a little bit about that turning point and uh, how you went from near death literally with no exaggeration to um, maybe the most productive and pro, uh, prolific time of your life yeah that i i remember i remember the day that i found out um and i remember just feeling uh your body just leaves you i guess and uh you're kind of in shock for a, a, fe a period of time and 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 then you go through the different stages of anger and frustration and and all of those things uh, the emotions that you go through and then ultimately, um, to make a decision on uh, on, on what you're going to do. And, and I had a great friend. He's a great friend today. And he always told me, Mark, there's always a way. There's always a way, uh, no matter what you're facing, what you're doing. And and I really took that to heart and said, there's always a way to deal with uh, your circumstances and, and uh, to make the most out of every, every single moment that you have. And so when I was in my uh, hospital room for... Uh, over a year, I just remember uh, saying, if I'm going to have to be in bed for 23 and a half hours a day, um, then I've got to do something. I can't just lay here and watch uh, the cooking channel, uh, which I did for a period of time when I was first there and, and realized that I, I could still accomplish a lot of my goals and dreams and make a difference. And so I um, 
I got busy while I was in the hospital bed and trying to uh, achieve my bucket list and to try to build and grow things that uh, hopefully could maybe impact others down the road. And um, that's when I, I wrote a lot of Drill Book. So, so, and one thing I want to point out, and so people may not know you that are watching this or listening, that so you're a person who pretty active, right? So you you played hockey, were a star, uh, growing up and very involved in sports, and then all of a sudden, you now you're expected to be sitting in bed for 23 and a half hours for a year in the hospital for a year. Um, this is how did I guess that alone must have been devastating, just not being physically uh, able to do anything, and so that you directed your energies mentally, I guess, and and focus your, uh, tell me a little bit about that that turning point and then how you got started and what the drill book uh, became. Sure, well, first of all, I wasn't a star. <laughs> I was, uh, I, I was uh, a, a young boy that enjoyed activity and friendships and all of the things that sports, uh, I was very active and had a family that was very engaged in sports. So uh, that was my lifestyle. And of course, chasing my young kids around was exhausting. So uh -huh. I didn't have much energy, energy at the end of the day. I probably had more when I was in the hospital. But um, uh, uh, as I went through that experience and into that, uh, that type of environment, and I remember walking the hallways in, in the unit that I was on, and I would look in every single room. And um, when you're in that hospital on the ward that I was on, there's no um, really interaction and courage, so you're not to communicate or, or uh, be close to people because of you know uh, picking up um, viruses and things like that, and you have no immunity. So you, you're kind of uh, mentally in your capsule, so to speak. And, and um, your whole life is just in your head. And um, I remember watching people that were 90 years old walk the, the, the one lap around the ward. And, and I just asked myself, what, what are they doing that for? Like, just let go, it's, it's time to let go. And, you know, I was um, struggling to make my circuit around and do that lap. And uh, people like that, if you wanna see courage and what courage is, and, and you see people that have a death sentence and, and they still fight for every moment to live and to stay alive. Um, that inspired me to keep walking around that hallway. And I would read the uh, motivational material that people, the messages that they would write on the walls. And, and I would stop and, and um, take a few more steps to read the next one. Mm -hmm. And I just said that, you know, if, if those people are doing that, I mean, it says a lot and they have a lot more wisdom than I do. And they lived uh, a full life and they're still fighting for the value of how important life is and you just don't want to give it up. And um, so that for me, um, it, when I went through my day-to-day -day routines and things like that, I always said for every doctor, every nurse that I dealt with, um, I wanted to um, hopefully use my battle to help uh, them and show them the value they gave to me and, and the, the, the care that I got and the support. I owed it to them too, to give back everything that I could to try to keep going ahead and get out of there and try to get back to life. So my goal was, if I could go a full day without thinking I was sick, then I would have made it. If I can just live and get back to the routines that people think are boring and things, I just, I just died to have the opportunity to be in rush hour traffic. I, I, <laughs> I wanted to um, be the person driving very, very slow and looking at the mountains because I just taking it. I mean, you, you, you just get into a, your, your routines and you, you miss so many things that are so incredible in life. And when those things are gone, then you really appreciate Mm -hmm. those moments and so even though I was stuck in that room uh, whether I was on uh, lockdown for a few weeks where I didn't have any human interaction mm -hmm. um, I always had those memories thoughts that uh, basically kept me going because I, I needed to get back there and, and have that experience again Wow what how long uh, before you started building some momentum in in that during that stretch uh, you, obviously what you said there was this huge struggle at first then you got to where you were doing the laughs in the hallway, and uh, well, I had two questions. One was, was there any specific, you mentioned, and I remember you talking about this in Phoenix, there were certain uh, quotes and stuff. Were there certain, any ones that ring out in your head still that help, still help you today to keep moving when you have a difficult day? Yeah, I, I, I think one of the things, I think all, all of my former students would, would tell you, and I've coached thousands of young athletes in, in the sport academies and things that I worked within, is that I always gave advice and I always shared quotes and tried to inspire people. And it's so easy to give advice and provide input. Mm -hmm. When you have to apply it to yourself, um, it's a lot more challenging. Mm -hmm. So I started to use some of the favorite ones that I had shared with my students on myself. Mm -hmm. And so I need to start applying these strategies to my life and what I do and how I try to do things. 
And so there's so, so many, I don't know if I could pick a favorite one, but um, uh, every, a lot of them were very personal ones too that people had written mm -hmm. about their journey. And uh, basically we're talking to you personally because they had made the same step. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones I really connected with is when they, it was a personal message that I know that they had, they had created, they had envisioned and I could feel what they were feeling. And that, those are the ones that really made me keep pushing forward. So now that you, uh, you know, I know you still have some health, you're still dealing with some health concerns perhaps, but you're healthy right now and living, living life and things are rocking in your world. Do yeah. you ever find yourself slipping back into, um, just that for grant, taking things for granted comfort zone or however living and if you do or how do you keep yourself from slipping into that is there anything you do regularly on a day-to-day -day basis you could share with us that might help us stay anchored and um and focused and in, in that perspective that you got you gain you know has that ever have you ever slipped back into uh how things used to be and if so how do you if so or how do you keep yourself from you know moving forward and and not taking things for granted and appreciating the rush hour traffic. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, fighting the human condition, I call yes, it, in that yes. I think every day, um, every day you have choices in everything that you do. And um, it's a gift to be able to make a choice. And um, some, a lot of people don't have the choice to, to, uh, to make decisions that we take for granted. Um, so when I think about things and I think about life, um, uh, people say, well, I got to live for the day. And, and we came up with uh, here, uh, one of the people that I work with here, we have what's called a live for two hours. And we have a two hour window every every two hours. Uh, we game plan our next two hours. So the day is mm -hmm. too long. We want to break it into even more simpler segments. Mm -hmm. So within two hours, I say to myself, okay, what, what can I do to um, achieve what I want to achieve, um, whether it's um, something work-related, family-related, a quick text to a friend that mm. needs a, 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 a cheer up, or uh, what can I accomplish? And, and I realize by trying to break into a smaller segment my day of what I do, um, and the same thing, I guess, in the hospital was, okay, if I can just get through mm. Um, these needles or this treatment of radiation, then I, I can do this in the next segment. Um, otherwise, time is to time is not consequential and time is not appreciated. Mm -hmm. But by breaking it down, I found I could achieve a lot more um, in my life each day. And so, the two-hour rule is when you're, especially when you're facing adversity or chaos or mm -hmm. um, you can't find answers, I think it really helps clearly define what your next step can be in your life. Wow, I love it. That's something I've never, I've never heard. Of. That's a completely original idea. I've never heard of, and as, as you, you do as well, study a lot of uh, great inspirational people. Uh, my business coach recently mentioned, uh, and he's really encourages people to think about a 30-day window instead of the full year. But you, as you know, so many uh, focuses are on big vision planning and strategic, and of course, we need to look forward. But uh, I love that idea to focus on what's just in the next two hours because that's really something you can impact, right? That's uh, that's remarkable. So do you usually share this with someone? You mentioned some people there at the office, or do you have a way that you help keep yourself accountable or, or focused on this and keep that momentum going? Yeah, I think it's um, it's teamwork related to people that you trust that um, you can talk to things about. And, and um, you know, if, if I see somebody else that's kind of getting overwhelmed and caught up and I'll just say, hey, two hours, and likewise, it'll come back my way, it, it, just to refocus. But I think um, to 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 deal with the challenges that life provides, to have a team around you that you trust, um, is so important. And and so many times when we have adversity, we we close all the doors and we we think, well, I'm just going to be headstrong and deal with it myself. Mm -hmm. When actually, there's a lot of people that maybe have experienced the same thing or similar things that. Um, can really help you take further steps than you could on your own. So building a team around yourself and your life and your family and your friends and the people you trust and respect has is, is been for me a, such a, a blessing. And I've been very lucky to uh, surround myself with those type of peoples and have fam, mm -hmm. my parents that brought me up that way. Um, mm -hmm. And they really love people. And um, having that love for people and, and looking for the good in everybody, you know, it's easy to pick people apart or identify mm -hmm. weaknesses, but I think a great strength of a leader is someone that finds all the great things about somebody and then um, also appreciates the differences and things and mm -hmm. but doesn't judge that person for that. And, and when you look for good in people, boy, whether you're coaching a, a hockey team as I do or uh, you're coaching in business, the same principles mm -hmm. apply. Absolutely. Yeah, so many uh, 
especially admire that in a you know leader as yourself and who you're the CEO of a growing company and uh, so many times I think that especially people in that higher leadership role feel like they need to be you know tough guy all the time it doesn't mean you're, you're still assertive and call out what you see but the fact that you're vulnerable enough to say hey I need your help and uh, I sense that you build those connections that have helped you achieve way more than any one person could on their own that's a that's I, powerful yeah I think you know great 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 leaders um they they don't tell people what to see but they help them understand where they need to look mm -hmm. and um I, I think that sometimes you get so busy and overwhelmed that you forget to look, you mm -hmm. forget to explore, and the people that have that acumen to be able to identify or recognize things or areas of weakness or strength in whatever they do, whatever's around them, um, those people are very gifted, and then they use that wisdom to really achieve uh, success in whatever they're mm -hmm. doing. That's something I remember you talking about too in Phoenix about the the heart of your coaching philosophy uh, based around the Socratic method and questioning. And I sense I'm sure that's something I know is I believe a very strong skill set as far as a leadership is helping people illuminate the blind spot or help them uncover the answer inside of themselves. Do you have any key questions that you like to ask yourself or of your team, uh, your in this case your business team, that have really helped you stay focused or help them stay focused? Yeah, I think uh, I, I always start with um, you know, what's your greatest fear mm. and understanding if people have fear. Usually when people don't achieve or accomplish what they're setting out to do, um, fear of failure or fear of something is, is, is usually a major obstacle that's front and center. And, and, and sometimes you get so busy you don't take the time to ask mm. to, um, to or to create a trusting relationship so they would tell you what their fear is. But everybody has fear. Mm -hmm. We all have fear every day. It's how we manage our fears. And I think understanding getting fear off the table so that someone says, okay, these are the things that are holding me back. Can you help me figure out how we navigate? And then back to the original premise, there's always a way. Mm. So you know what many people define as fear actually isn't fear. And, and there's many reasons they won't step off the, the, the pool deck. Um, and if, if we can help understand that um, and then support them and know that you're there with them, um, the most intelligent and the most successful people make the most mistakes mm. and they fail the fastest. So if you fail the fastest, the most, mm. you, you're gonna have the most wisdom and, and most experience. Um, yet in life, I guess from the time we're very young, we're taught that failure or we learn that failure is a negative thing. Mm -hmm. And we want to reframe failure and, and shift that paradigm. Wow. Have you, that's a, I love the fail, fail the fastest and you'll be perhaps the most successful. Have you had, uh, do you have any tools or techniques or anything you've used when, when someone uh, is still stuck or you're trying to get them, maybe even that you, as you mentioned, you critical, you build the trust first so that they're willing to even go there when you ask that question. And I love, it's so powerful too. That's your first question that you ask. Uh, once you get to this point in the relationship. So if there's still, uh, if you, any tools you found that help them, let's say they say, yeah, here's where I'm, you know, I'm uncomfortable. Do you have a process or anything you ask next to help them get a reality check or face the fear, overcome it? Yeah, I think the next step for me is uh, identifying the difference between goals and rewards. Mm -hmm. And um, the goal is never to win. A, let's say, let's use a sport reference. The goal is not to win the Stanley Cup. The goal is to get up every day, have great habits, have a direction, have a purpose and a focus, and, and, and then work hard to achieve what you want. The reward is the Stanley Cup. Mm -hmm. And and I think many times the, the people confusing the different differentiating between a goal and a reward is an obstacle I think that, that we all face every day and whatever we're trying to, whether it's mm -hmm. build a relationship with your wife or your children, whatever it may be, it's understanding that the process and the journey through your life is what is your life. And the ring, the Stanley Cup ring or whatever is a representation of your journey, but enjoy and love that journey. And so the next step and part of that conversation is that if you have people that are passionate, the number one ingredient in my perspective is the most important ingredient in life is passion. Mm. And if you have people that you're working with that are passionate about success, um, they need a little steering sometimes or shifting um, mm -hmm. to get them in the right direction. But I would rather have them with that passion making tons of mistakes mm -hmm. as they forge ahead and they're going to change the world and then than to sit back and be afraid of, of, of jumping into a project or, or uh, something that they're working on. 
So as a leader, our job is to remove excuses and create reasons to succeed versus reasons to fail. Mm. So I, I love the passion piece. I remember us connecting on that as well. And uh, it's part of my current keynote that I've been doing for an organization. And my, my position is that look for passion when you're hiring people. And if they're not passionate about something, it doesn't even have to be the exact thing that the company focuses on. Uh, yeah. I remember asking that in interviews, what are you passionate about? People would look at me and go, oh, I'm, come on, this is a job interview, make something up, you know? So <laughs> yeah. I, I'm curious, do so when you're looking for the right person, I know you guys are growing as an example right now, and I'm sure you're adding team members. Uh, if you if you don't sense that they're a really passionate person, do you pass them up uh, and just say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find people who are passionate and we'll train the other things we need? Or do you, how, what's your position and philosophy on that? Do you, uh, I know it's important to you. I'm wondering if you take on people who you may think that aren't really as passionate as they need to be, or do you or do you wait to find that person who's really lit up about life and bring them on the team? That's such a great question. Well, I can tell you this is that I have a, a photographic memory. So in my journeys through life, I always remember the people that have had an influence or impact me, or I've respected what they do, or yeah. I, I've, 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 I've been involved with them on certain things. Those are the people that I go after when I know I don't try to fit a person into a job. I find the person first that is versatile, that is very passionate about their life and is enthusiastic about whatever they do, mm -hmm. whether it be going for a bike ride or um, hammering out a tough, a difficult meeting, and then build the position around their, them. Mm -hmm. And if you've got those type of people in your environment that are adaptable, versatile, I think you can achieve incredible things. So whenever I look for somebody, um, I, I, I reference all of my experiences and I trust my instincts and what people ha bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And then I'll try to create the position around that versus the, the opposite, wow. which is I think probably the more traditional approach. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we, you know, the standard approach is you have this position to fill. These are the roles. These are, we even build this job description, right? And I think knowing what you need is important. But it doesn't have to be filled by one. I see it. that's brilliant because I, that's another thing I've never really heard people uh, point out in that way. That usually we you always try to fill the position. So you go after the people who are the ultimate passionate people that you've known, and then say how could they be part of the team and contribute? That's fascinating. So then yeah. and then I guess is that then you write the job responsibility or the roles around things that support their strengths, and then you take those other things that maybe they wouldn't be that strong at, and you keep them on a list of outstanding strengths we still need and you try to find the person for that? Yeah, I, I always ask people and I think if you asked anyone that, that I work with, um, you know, I always ask them, what do you love? Like what mm. are the things that you would love about this job or potential job? Um, I don't have a specific job description. I know mm -hmm. here's the outcomes that we need mm -hmm. and our goals within this, uh, this type of area. But what do you what turns your crank? Mm -hmm. And and then many p times people sit up and they just light up and and they love to tell you about what they love. Like because mm -hmm. we all that's the way we are. Mm -hmm. Then if I can scope the certain pieces around that, um, then I think, um, boy, that's the that's the easy part. And the hard part is to find that person that has that that enthusiasm mm -hmm. and passion that just they walk into the office and and everybody's. All of a sudden, that aura comes in, right. and you feel more inspired to perform yourself. And uh, that's a contagious, I think, a contagious work environment, a contagious home environment. Mm -hmm. You know, a dad that goes home from from work and is exhausted and had a rough day, and bang, all of a sudden the kids are, you know, one little thing, and he's over the top. I think we all deal with those things each and mm -hmm. every day. Sure. And so I, I sometimes try. I think we all battle that, but I, I think the key is is to. Um, at the core of it is when you're around people that engage you, the battle is so much easier because they make you better without even making an effort to do so. And and the reverse is true as well. If you've mm -hmm. got negative people that are can't doers or why why am I doing this? But they're asking why for the wrong reasons mm -hmm. because they want to take a shortcut and don't want to do something. Um, I, I think that support team really at the end of the day brings out that extra five to ten percent in everybody mm -hmm. on every task. And when you multiply that in a business and then scale it um, and put the, the commerce behind it, I think that's the difference between a successful uh, enterprise and one that's mm. probably struggling. It seems that courage is contagious, isn't it? And uh, 
Yeah. You get those people together that can be very powerful. I, this is uh, my bias. I believe people uh, and leaders of organizations underestimate the power of what you just said. And uh, I know if you ask someone, every CEO would probably say, oh, of course I want passionate people. But what I see is that it's not, you know, it's not the priority in the interview process. They look at so many other factors and uh, I couldn't agree more with you. That's that's brilliant insight. What if you, have you had an opportunity or a situation, not an opportunity, but one where you end up, so if they're not passionate, they didn't, that, the passion test, then I assume they, they're just not a good fit, right? Then you probably didn't pursue them to begin with. If you're introduced yes. to them, maybe someone else introduces you to them and you don't sense they have that passion. You just, you just tell them you don't think it's a good fit. And then you, you don't, even if you think they're brilliant, you don't try to make it work, right? You've learned Yeah, that. correct. I, I don't interview people. Mm. Um, I always tell people that your interview was seven years ago when I met you mm. and, and your day to day and how you live your life and what you do and the values that you have, uh, whether I've been their friend or uh, an associate or, you know, have had some type of relationship with them in the past, that for me is their interview. And mm. those are the, the key ingredients, the pillars, the building blocks. I think that, um, that, that you can build something successful mm -hmm. with. Um, but to sit down and think that asking someone questions about, without knowing much about them about this and that, I don't think that um, that will lead to the same type of um, successful candidate than mm -hmm. than actually your track record with somebody over time. And and I also trust the relationships of the people that make recommendations mm -hmm. that have known individuals. So that networking is such a key part of business, as we always know. It's a cliche, right? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. we've got a network. And, sure. But networking with people that you trust that have um, their arms out. I mean, that's mm -hmm. how I met you, for example. Mm -hmm. And and I love to associate with people that I respect who, who I know are going to be associating with other people that I would love to meet also. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Life's too short to be hanging out with jackasses <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. and the sword. Yeah. That's what I say. So yeah. uh, it took me a while to learn that, you know, really. But um, to be a bit critical, uh, protective with my time is uh, I, I do. I want to spend t more time with people like yourself. So uh, you mentioned going on the uh, when you we get home at the end of the day and we're busy, we have busy lives, even if you're a full time homemaker and, you know, there's those struggles. Um, do you have a routine or anything that helps you just reconnect and bring your best when you walk back in the door at the end of the day? Uh, and I, we have this, we both have, I know you have 14 year old and 12 year old children and I have mine are the same age. So, uh, how do you keep yourself from just, you know, I find some days I'll just come home and we'll just go through the motions and we got our head down and we're busy and then you like you roll right into the kitchen or wherever that it spot is. And like you said, you snap or you, how do you make sure that you, uh, you don't fall into that, that comfort zone and those habits that, don't lead to the most, uh, the best engagement with the people who need us most, our families. My wife would probably have a different answer than I would. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> she's not ideals, on the call. But <laughs> following the ideals is different. Um, that's a, that's a, such a great question. I, I think for me, it's this, it's most people, if you ask them, they put all of their energy and their heart into what they do during the day. Mm. And it should be reversed. The energy in your heart should go into what you do after work with your family, with your friends, because ultimately, at the end of the day, those relationships, when you're on your deathbed, I remember reading something about what are the 10 things. So they had people that were terminally ill, and they asked them, if you could live your life over, what are 10 things that you would do different? And all of them made so much sense when you read it and you're sitting back and saying, holy cow, you know, I'm way off the, off the mark here. But I think a lot of people expend their energy, a lot of their themselves from eight to five. But when your family needs you and when you really can connect and make a difference is from five until bedtime. Mm -hmm. And I always, um, I had bad days. You know, my wife come home and say, you're bringing work home and, and this and that. And I think we all go through that. Sure. But I just, I think it's a mental conscious decision that you make when you walk in that door, you know, to either make dinner for the family or just clean up. And, and um, I remember I was at a presentation in 1993 and the presenter, um, who's now the president of Hockey Canada, he did a task with all of the the coaches that were in attendance and he had us all write, take out a sheet of paper and write down five things that we were going to do and in our life. And I, at the time, was 23 or something like that. And I remember, and he said, you know, be realistic, but, but strive for success in what you want to be and who you want to be. And I remember writing those five things down. And then he said, well, every time you want to veer away from your outcome of your five important things that drive your life, then pull this out of your wallet and take a look at it. 
Well, I carried that sheet around for years and it went through the washing machine and, you know, it was the ink was running all over the place. And, and I remember that, you know, when I w was veering away from what I thought I wanted to be or what I wanted to achieve, I would pull that out and just refocus myself on ultimately at the end of the day, this is where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And, and so it helped me fight the uh, temptation to not follow my dreams and everyone has dreams and, um, dream big. I believe in dream big. You should, you should go after it, but to achieve those dreams takes a commitment and helping yourself stay committed. So one of my most important things was to be a great family man and a, and a dad one day I had no kids at the time mm -hmm. and always have that as my most important priority. Mm -hmm. So that was number one on my list. And so when I come home, I always remind myself that I'm so lucky to have kids mm -hmm. and I'm so lucky. I look at them as role models for me and a lot of the qualities they have, I never had. And I, I think they, they're, they're leading me and yet they're 12 and 14 years old. And same with my wife, you know, you, um, she sent me a text the other day and just said, I wanted to say this. I ne never say it enough. And I responded to her, you do every day by what you do. Mm -hmm. And so it's not what you say. It's, you know, it's what you typically do. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of motivational rhetoric and all those things, but your day to day, how you lead your life, I think is probably the most influential thing you can ever do mm -hmm. at home or, or in those times when you get home and you're exhausted, it's your actions that speak way louder than words do. Wow. No doubt. That's very helpful. Cause I know that's something we all, as you admitted to, we all struggle with staying focused on those crit most critical, most important things. And we certainly yeah. want to be passionate about our work as well. So, yeah. uh, so what do you, I know, and this is interesting too, because so I've asked this, I ask people this question sometimes and whether it's a coaching relationship or a presentation or a friend, you know, when you, um, when you're at looking at the end of your life and you look back, what will you be, um, you know, wish you had done more or what would, what do you want to be known for? All those really powerful questions. What's so interesting about you is that you've actually been there literally. And I know we didn't, we talked about it a little bit, but, uh, I mean, you literally were there at the edge of death more than once, uh, if I recall yes. correctly. And, uh, so you've actually been there. So different for you, this question, I guess, cause you've really had this thought this through. Um, even at this point in your life is what do you, two questions, I guess. One is what do you, what do you want to be remembered most for, um, as far as a legacy? And then, uh, what do you still want to accomplish? What do you feel? I know you feel like you've got a lot of good work still left to do. And, uh, they're just the beginning of an amazing future with drill book and, what's what's coming next so uh i know two two big questions there wrapped in one but yeah uh i i always was the type of person that wanted to leave a legacy and how could i maybe change some you know the world mm. and and then the quote was something like you know in order to change the world you must first change yourself and uh many people have all these wild ambitions to grow and change their community and then change their country and first of all change yourself um mm. for me the legacy and the only legacy that matters is your family and your close friends and the impact that you leave. And um, it wasn't, I, I made the mistake one time of saying, you know, Drobuck will be one of my legacies and really my only legacy will be my family. Mm -hmm. And that's what's most important for sure. Because at the end of the day, um, your family and your friends and your journey through life, those are the things that I thought about when I thought it could be over and mm -hmm. I might not make it through the next week. Um, I, I never once thought about a business. I never once thought about um, financial success. Uh, it, the, the core root of, of what I thought about was, you know, my experiences, my memories and, and how I just so crave to have that happen again. Mm -hmm. So I guess that answers maybe the first part of the question. Mm -hmm. I think that's a legacy. And the second part, what do I have uh, left to do? I always had a goal that, um, to be a philanthropist of some of some sort, to be able to have the ability to support the things that I, I think are really important in the world. And we forget so often how lucky we are to live where we live mm -hmm. in the countries that we live in and to see the way that 80% of the world lives and, and the waking up when, whether there's a bomb dropping right beside your house or, or, um, the killings and the mercy killings and things like that is just we have we lose sight of the reality of how many people live and we're so insulated from that mm -hmm. it's a gift to have 
to live in the era that we do. And I think if I could ever try to make a difference and uh, whether that be financially or the ability to impact change, um, I, I would like to try to, like we all do, leave the mm -hmm. world a better place. So my goal would be to be a philanthropy um, uh, type of person that could, could impact and help progress things mm -hmm. that I, I think we're, uh, we're immune to living where we do. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So are there any things that, uh, any current resources or books that, uh, or people that you are using in your own life as an inspiration or helping you stay on track or anything you've, uh, you know, shared recently or uncovered that's really made an impact in that regard that you could recommend to us to help us stay inspired or focused or tactical, uh, what are, where are you where are you pulling you from your uh, what's what areas are you pulling from to help you uh, stay focused and improving in your own personal life? Um, I I love to watch movies and I don't watch enough movies, but I love uh, I find sometimes I don't have a, a lot of time to read, so I'm kind of an on the go uh, type of person. Um, things that have really impacted me and there's so many like I just oh I you know the Lone Survivors uh, a recent one that. Um, it's a book that uh, by Thomas Luttrell and and the story of of the Navy SEALs and mm -hmm. and um, and their journey and the decisions they made and what they do and and all of that and and that story is so impactful and um, uh, I, I just think that the reason that impacted me so much is that um, before you encounter anything you make a decision of what you're going to do and that's what you do and so um, you know in my journey. I made a decision what I was going to do before it happened to me. So I knew the treatment was coming or I knew this obstacle was there and I made the decision what I'm going to do no matter what, this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. You make that decision before and you don't get swayed by the outcome of that event. You, you take control of what you can and you say, this is what I'm going to do regardless. And, and that focus, that singular focus to achieve that obstacle, or overcome that is I think a very powerful thing that the lone survivor represents is that you know, he, when he's laying, when Thomas is laying in the cliff in a hole and he's looking at the moon and he grabs a rock and he reaches out and he's paralyzed from the waist down and he draws a line in the sand. He crawls over that line. He doesn't know where he's crawling to, where he's going. He's in the middle of the, the desert and he does that for seven miles. Gosh. And I look at that and there's a person that made the decision that he's going to live and he's going to do whatever he's can he whatever he can and at no time did he accept that he was going to give up and and i think that is inspirational for me as far as authors go there's so many incredible authors mm -hmm. um i was a huge fan of john wooden mm -hmm. um and um he was a you know one of the most renowned coaches in history of all sport mm -hmm. and his life lessons and the stories that he tells about his interaction with uh, young people and athletes and you really realize that you don't work with athletes you work with young people mm -hmm. that just happen to love a sport mm -hmm. and um he, he was always a a person that i i would always kind of make sure i read read his things and I, i'm kind of a sports guy so i love mm -hmm. sport books uh, pat riley the winner within um I, i'm really glad well is, is outstanding and all the new research coming in, uh, out on, on those fields mm -hmm. on um performance and then recently you know there's a lot of people like john o'sullivan who's one of our partners and did changing the game project and then getting to meet john valentine the kids uh, kids in the game and getting kids into sports mm. you meet these people that are doing these things there's amazing things to try to change uh tradition and the way we've always done things and I, i've just enjoyed all those experiences and then finally um, more so than reading i think it's the people that i interact with day to day mm. um, all the fellow people that i work with uh, in drawback that are just amazing people and and i learn so much every day from them and and then the the relationships that I've connected with people like yourself through those relationships. Um, it's just so exciting to get up and, 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 and I, I learn more from conversations, I think, than, than from reading about mm -hmm. certain things. So my day to day interaction is just what I really enjoy the most. Wow. And I, I, I'm with you. I think I have the belief that people, um, so someone might look at you and say, well, you're the CEO and you can choose, you can fire the person if you don't like them. And I'm stuck in doing what I do every day. And I, I don't have a choice about the people I'm, I'm around and with. Don't you, would you agree that people still with, if you do it with intention, that you, everyone still has a choice of the energy you put into a relationship or who, 
uh, and we spend and waste a lot of time on, uh, you know, social media, connecting with people. I'm not saying there's something, anything wrong with social media, but connecting with people who maybe aren't really benefiting us. And I, f- I feel like people have more power than they realize if they use intention and focus to create a life that's more enriched by being very intentional about the people that they spend any energy with and on. I think that's critically important. I think it sounds like something you do naturally, but would you agree that people, even if they're not the CEO or they're just the regular Joe out there or gal, that everyone has more potential to have a more rich life by focusing and being intentional about the people they they are with every day and experience? Yeah, I think most people um, impose a ceiling on themselves Mm -hmm. and and they they are the greatest enemy. You know, the quote is get out of your own way. Mm And, and I think um, good leadership means um, uh, helping people achieve a goal that, or an outcome that they never thought they could get to themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and so many of us put obstacles in our way that no one else is putting there. It's just our perception mm-hmm. of things or our reality from looking from our perspective. And a gift is to be able to step out of your shoes and into someone else's and understand their perspective. And, and when you do that, whether you're in a negotiation or whatever you're doing to understand the perspective of the entity you're, nego- you're dealing with um, and knowing where they're coming from, if you have that information, you'll do a much better job yourself. Mm-hmm. So I think that um, great leaders, it's, it's maybe not defined probably that simply, but great leaders, I think, have that ability to mm-hmm. do that and remove, help people remove obstacles that they self-impose on themselves. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. tell me a little bit about the uh, the drill book. I know that's something, a very passionate focus of uh, a lot of your time. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the drill book and where you're headed with that? Sure. Yeah. The drill book started as a, um, I guess I've been coaching in um, in the sport academy world for, for 17 years, working with, with young kids and, and trying to, to help make sports fun. And uh, practicing historically is not seen mm-hmm. as something that you know, people enjoy doing. And uh, I just was of the mindset that I think practice can be a heck of a lot of fun and even as fun as playing an, an official game. Mm. And so I, uh, over all of those years, I, I wrote down a lot of things, recorded a lot of things and, and tried to study um, how we can develop kids to the optimal level while having so much fun. And hence, um, I had I'd done another uh, software uh, uh, type of thing and uh, probably before the technology allowed it to fully um, grow to the level in, in the early 2000s and then um, I, I just kind of said when technology is is going to be ready uh, for the ideas I have for Drillbook then I can try to deliver this to the, the global market so that's exactly what happened so when I w- w- was sick I, um, I forged down a path to try to uh, put together the technology team and the business acumen, the business leaders in North America to help bring this to life. And then Drillbook Drill Book was spawned. So the content is one thing, but then you need the delivery system uh, that, that fits in with society today, which is apps, mobility, mm-hmm. you know, everything immediate, all visual and kinesthetic, not uh, auditory or not reading. And um, we started with hockey and we, we did that uh, we've been five months. We've launched it five months ago and uh, that's been really exciting to see how that's gone. And we have you know over a million views on it, which is coaches and kids and parents using it, which wow. is really neat. And then we uh, just launched soccer and baseball in January in the U.S., uh, baseball in Orlando and soccer in Philadelphia. And uh, we had to find the the person like me that was in that sport mm-hmm. that would, would have that vision of uh, randomized learning for kids and off the charts fun and Disneyland approach to uh, to youth sports. And then through that, it just kind of spawned and took on a life of its own. And, mm-hmm. and now we're pushing it ahead to try to uh, really try to make a difference and, and have it benefit kids that can't afford sports, mm-hmm. get involved in sports. 60% of kids in the U.S. can't afford to participate in organized sport. Wow. And then those that do, out of that, 70% drop out of sports by the 10th grade. So when you look at those two numbers alone, um, inherently that's one of the reasons we did Drillbook is all the people in Drillbook want to create a better experience for mm-hmm. kids and keep them active and healthy and having fun. It's not about making the professional ranks or it's not about elitism. Mm-hmm. It's about putting the tools in the coaches' hands that can allow them to have kids take that journey with them and have so much fun 
that mm. they are addicted to sport for life. Nice, wonderful. And I, uh, it's it, uh, the business model is uh, in. I think what people need to know is that it's actually free, right, for the coaches, the kids, and the the uh, the parents of the sport teams that they sign up for free, and you get what amazing. I know the. I know when I was so here, there's my quick little story. And then one thing we connected on, I was, uh, in, I remember in kindergarten, they asked for volunteers with the kids soccer team. I think this is a common story for people. And I said, sure, I'll help out. You know, you feel you're standing there. So you've, you've got to act like you're uh, going to help. So yeah, I didn't know anything about soccer. I said, I'll do something, you know, I'll be the ball boy. <laughs> and then next yeah. thing you know, the guy says, Hey, we need an extra coach. We have a lot of kids. Would you coach? And I was like, I had no idea what I was doing. I remember ordering a book off Amazon and you know studying at night, trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do at practices and how to keep the kids active. And uh, I got a, I did all right, I guess. But uh, I kidded people. And we moved school districts, and our friends said, "Why did you move school districts?" And I said, "It, you know, I had to get out of soccer because next thing you know, six seasons of soccer, and I was still a coach." I said, "It was like the mafia." You volunteer for a job and you're in. You can't. You can't leave. <laughs> you know, yeah. If I'd had the drill That's book, true. I think we might still live in that school uh -huh. district, and I've been a lot more successful. So I know as a yeah. coach, as a whether you're an experienced coach or you're a volunteer, it gives you all the tools you need to to really engage the children. The parents can stay organized. That was another thing. My wife pulled her hair out trying to be the manager. I know that makes those things. It just it covers. You all have figured it out from A to Z. I've just been uh, blown away with. Uh, had the depth of it. Thanks. So I'm thank looking you. forward to your success in that for sure. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been, uh, been a lot of fun. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if it can help a dad uh, or a mom that's uh, lost the coin toss <laughs> and, and has to coach and uh, create a great experience for kids. Um, I think I heard a quote the other day that it's kind of staggering um, from, from one of our uh, people that we, we collaborate with quite a bit. And he said that, this will be the first generation of kids that aren't supposed to live as long as us. And when they look at the reasons why mm. the inactivity, obesity and diabetes and, and those factors, um, getting kids out in the backyard, playing with dad and, and playing tag and doing those things versus uh, on the phone, you know, kids are texting, they're downstairs, you're upstairs and you get texts when you're on the couch. Mm. I mean, that is the new society and the new reality. And so if we can help maybe be a proactive part of changing that and, having them out playing the funnest games with their dad in the backyard or uh, that, that I think will help, you know, uh, a lot of people in a lot of avenues and, and, uh, and that's the goal. Wow. That's a, certainly a worthwhile goal. goal and uh, I know you're going to be successful in it and well, uh, thanks. it's amazing. So uh, a couple of last couple of questions there was uh, one thing, is there a few things that one or two things you would encourage people as soon as they get done listening to this or watching this, is there a couple things you would encourage people to do immediately? What's some steps that yeah. you would say, Hey, if you do this right now, ask yourself this question, take this step, write this down. Uh, your life will, will be different, uh, faster than you realize. What would you tell people that, uh, if that would, you know, it's going to make a difference that would help go home tonight. And as soon as you get home, tell your wife, your kids, how much you respect them and how they make you better and and how lucky you are to have them. Hmm. And I think many times we get so busy again, we forget to to let people know what we think and how much we appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And imagine if you receive that information yourself. Hmm. So I, I think the first step to change is not a complicated formula. You know, it's it's uh, taking the time to, to make an effort. Um, John Wooden, I think, had an adage that every day he strove to do something for someone else that could never pay him back. Mm. And it's a great way to live. When you um, when you live that way, I think good karma and good things happen uh, in return, and you can make a difference that then starts that, that chain forward. So that would be my one word of advice in mm. that regard, to make an instant change. And then try to adopt that as part of what you do consistently, whether mm. it's at work or in your environments that you're in or the circles you're within, be, be the person that, that make, that, that strives to make others better and, um, and stepping out of your comfort zone into that learning zone and the panic zone, mm. uh, which is where the high achievers live. They, 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 uh, if you stay in your comfort zone, um, you're through experience, your comfort zone gets bigger and it expands, mm. which is great. But if you really want to challenge yourself and you want to, have exciting things happen and new challenges and opportunities. You are the person that steps out, nobody else into that learning zone. And I think when you're in that learning zone, you can retreat back into the comfort zone, but the risk takers, what we call risk takers, um, 
they move out into those areas where they know there's going to be failure and yet it gets to be a pretty unique experience when you can step out and i think we all have challenges and mm -hmm. we don't like the normal every day but if you just sit in that comfort zone and you do what you do um you know the result will be the same mm -hmm. you know to do what you've never done you must try what you've never tried Fan. And you mentioned that a lot of it, it and, you know, as you know, that's my, the core of my message and my passion to help people keep stretching that comfort zone. You mentioned the panic zone, too. And uh, mm -hmm. can you talk about that for a moment and panic versus the learning zone? And do you yeah. recommend to people how much time do you recommend people spending in each zone or what's uh, what is your philosophy on that? Yeah, the, in the panic zone, I guess, is defined as, you know, failures assured when you step out into those areas. Sorry about the phone call oh, there. Nice. Uh, Trying to get rid of that. Uh, when you step out in the panic zone, there's going to be um, unknown adversity. And I always think of a, of a person like Thomas Edison. I think Thomas Edison had 1,093 patents wow. by the time he passed away. And every time he found something that wouldn't work, um, most people would deem that as failure. He framed it and said, every time I figured out something that wouldn't work, it was a solution to what that led me to the path of what would so failure inherently for him was success because it didn't work so I had to try another avenue so the panic zone means you're stepping out into a world whereby um, you're a curve jumper meaning um, uh, I, I think if you study Apple and, and some of the stories mm -hmm. with Apple I'll reference one that said that experts know nothing if you're an expert you improve 5% of sameness mm. a curve jumpers conceptualizing what other people can't even fathom mm -hmm. so five years ago many people can't fathom what is happening today in the social media world it didn't exist and so the curve jumpers are living in that panic zone they're conceptualizing ideas and they're, they're so far ahead and then the experts jump on and try to follow that once something's established so um, how long per day would you stay in that zone i think inherently there's always a retreat and a progress step out and retreat back based upon things like financial circumstances, um, uh, you know, enjoyment of the work environment, mm -hmm. the people you collaborate with that allow you to use your, your tools and your gifts. Um, so ultimately, I don't think you're there permanently. I think we always retreat every day, um, but we have the courage and what we define as risk is different than how someone else would define risk. Mm -hmm. Risk to, a, to a, a person living in that zone is not is uh, uh, to someone else death, mm -hmm. but it's your perspective on how you look at risk. And so w w when I look at what happened to me, um, risk to me now is so much different mm -hmm. than it was before. And financial things and whatever aren't even on the radar uh, as it per pertains to what is risky uh, versus um, you know things that you face. Wow. So I think reframing risk is. Uh, really what is is risk for everybody it's different and for me it's a lot different than it was three three years ago oh, wow yeah powerful the greatest risk is to do nothing yes absolutely yeah that's powerful are there any, anything else you want to share with us before we wrap up well i i think it's just been a i what i really hope is that you know a couple of things that we've talked about or one thing would trigger with somebody to to make a change or to try to um, hopefully motivate them to um, go after what they want. You've got one shot at your life and um, you got one kick at it. Greatest cliche there is. Mm -hmm. But um, I think at the end of the day, you know, when you're aspiring and really chasing your dreams, don't do things that, that don't make you happy. Pursue your passion and the rest fits together. And if you're pursuing something you're not passionate about, you'll, you're, you're going to look back guaranteed in years and wonder what you were doing or why you did it. And there's many reasons to say you're not going to do something and find reasons there are, pursue your passions and dreams. And I think that ultimately you'll have the happiness that um, that just keeps forging you ahead and you'll be healthy, uh, healthier, uh, you'll have a better mindset and I think you'll be able to establish better relationships when you love what you do. Mm. Wow. So that's really what I found is now I do every day I wake up, I do exactly what I want to do every day. There's nothing I would rather do than what I do. And I know that's a great gift to have. And I know people mm -hmm. always say, well, geez, I wish I could have that. You can have that. Go and do it. Make your choices and commit to what you're going to do, like you said, with focus and a purpose. Mm -hmm. And then you create your own outcome in life. Wow. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Mark, for spending time with us and uh, sharing your life and uh, going into some uh, some very uncomfortable places and you've been through and sharing the journey and your lessons and so much, so much, so many rich ideas in there. Uh, very tactical, inspirational at all levels. So I'm just blessed to have met you and to know you and you're an absolute inspiration and uh, the world is lucky to have you. I can't oh, wait to hear about uh, hear about how Drillbook uh, grows and makes an impact in children's lives and kids and parents who are struggling to coach and uh, what a, what a life you're living. So you're a model for all of us to uh, live up to. Thank you oh, so much. Thanks. And you as well. And I, I, a lot of those words that uh, thank you for the kind words. And uh, I think meeting people like yourself and what you do for for all of your listeners and all the people involved in your in your realm, um, it, they're so lucky, and uh, I, I hope that they all have an opportunity, like I did, to actually sit with you on a couch for two or three hours, where time just—I looked at my watch, I remember, and it was all of a sudden two or three to yeah. three o'clock in the morning. And I, I said to myself, when I went to bed that night, I just wish, I hope people could have the same experience I just had. When you you're so wound up, I don't think I slept because you just connected and you just you just found something that that was so um, powerful. And I, I just hope your many of your people have that opportunity to spend time with you like I did. Wow. So thanks. Thank you, Mark. That's, a, that, yeah. that's the best compliment I've had in a long time. I'll have to oh, thank you. listen back to this when I'm having a day where I feel like I'm struggling. We all do. So surround yeah. yourself with people like Mark right here and uh, life is better, no question. And I think we do that with intention. Everything is better. Thank you so much, my friend. Thanks, Manly. Uh, okay. This is a Thanks. Manly with Vertical Lessons. We're doing our best to make sure that you're able to stretch your comfort zone, in addition to you to amazing people like Mark, who can inspire you to do that, lead your life with more impact, and ultimately reach your next summit. Until next time, this is Manly, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.